Um, Romans 13. And the question is this. Must we always obey government? The answer is no. <laughs> We're done. That was the shortest study I've ever... <laughs> we, we should. Most of the time. But as far as always, do we have to always obey the government? The Bible does not teach that. Romans 13. And we'll, we'll look at the first uh, seven verses here uh, in just a moment. But this question comes up because we have been witnessing an unprecedented abuse of power in America during this coronavirus situation. Whatever you think about the virus, that's not my point this morning. You can't argue with the fact there's been an abuse of power. Thankfully, not all leaders in government are guilty of that, but many are. And it doesn't take you long if you look into it to see example after example after example. I mean, you got people being fined and or arrested for things like going to a public park to play with their children. Uh, one lady was harassed by the police because she took her child over to a friend's house to play. You've got business owners being fined and or arrested for not closing down. I mean, good night. There are other businesses that are open. The liquor stores never close down. For some reason, they're considered essential. Even though there's 80,000 people that die every year on average because of alcohol-related problems. They ought to shut them down first. <laughs> <laughs> But the business issue, but hey, what about pastors and churches? The, there have been a lot of cases like this. Thankfully, the Attorney General, Bill Barr, has sided with pastors and churches. But for, for just holding services. And some of them, I mean, the case of the, the church in Mississippi, two churches, in fact, that I know of, they were having drive-in services. They weren't even meeting in the building, and they were given tickets, $500 tickets. Things like this. Um, I've heard of pastors that were literally arrested uh, for holding services. Now, we went along with the recommendation for a little while because of the projections, even though I personally didn't buy into the projections. I said, well, let's play it safe and let's, you know, look at, you know, our community. We don't want to be a stumbling block to our community. And we decided as a church. To, I mean, because our folks are grounded and we could, it's not like if we close our doors, everybody's going to fall apart. We have a relationship with God. We're in the Bible every day. We can put our services online. So I thought we can handle closing down for a little while. I didn't want to, but I thought, hey, we'll do that. And so we the church decided to do that, but then the church decided uh, to reopen. And you say, well, I don't remember voting on it. Well, the, the way things are set up in the Word of God you have a, an overseer for a reason. And, you know, there is leadership and there is a way things are structured. And not ever, I don't know if we'll ever, when it comes to issues like that, you may not ever have 100% agreement. But people, our church has been free. If you want to come, come. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I mean, obviously, and we're not, we're not looking down on anybody for the decision they make. Everybody has the liberty to do what's best for them. But we're not going to keep everything closed down because a few people want it to. We want to have the doors open for the people who want to come. We believe in liberty. <laughs> now, how should we respond when governors and local authorities pretend they pretend that they have the authority to tell us when we can meet and how we can meet. They do not have that authority in America. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble. I wonder why our government doesn't want people assembling too much. To petition the government for a redress of grievances. The First Amendment. Now, 
There's nothing in the Constitution, which the Constitution basically is rules for our government to operate by, which is very unfortunate that we got a lot of people in leadership who I guarantee have never read the Constitution. I think that ought to be, you know, obviously a requirement. <laughs> but the Bill of Rights, that's personal liberties. Nothing in that says these will be suspended in the case of a pandemic. That you have these rights unless there's a virus going around, right? Once we easily surrender our rights, we're going to wind up losing them. Government did not give us our rights. And they have not the authority to take them away. Benjamin Franklin, I'm sure you've heard this quote before, but it's one of the great quotes from our founding fathers. He said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And that's the whole strategy. If you keep people in fear, then you can control them. And, you can, and people, a lot of people hand over their liberty for a little bit of safety. What does the Bible say? You say, well, we're Christians and the Bible comes first. Absolutely. I'm a Christian before I'm an American. So what does the Bible say about human government? What does it say about our responsibility as Christians toward the government? Um, after all, the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So let's consider what Paul said since he wrote to us in this present age. And I'll tell you up front, it's not the place of the church to cause insurrection against the government. It's not the place of the church to try to overthrow the government and to fight the government and so forth. However, neither are we told that we must unconditionally submit to everything they tell us to do. Romans. Romans. It's the... The first in order of Paul's epistles, it's not the first one he wrote by inspiration, but it's placed first because it's the foundational book of doctrine for this present age of grace. A simple outline is in the first eight chapters, the emphasis is on doctrine, our justification and identification in Christ. Then chapters 9 through 11 are parenthetical, uh, and the emphasis there is dispensational. What about Israel? Chapters 9 through 11. Then chapters 12 through 16, the emphasis is practical. And what Paul does is he gives us practical application based on the doctrine of the first eight chapters. In chapter 12 of Romans, Paul gives practical instruction concerning our relationship toward God. Now that's first and foundational. If you submit to Him, everything else will fall into place. But then he talks about our relationship toward the church and toward the world, and even our enemies. And come to chapter 13, it's our relationship toward human government. And chapter 14 and 15, it's toward the weaker brethren. So a lot of practical stuff in there about how to deal with people. Now, the church is called out of the world system. A church is a called out assembly. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. My conversation's in heaven. I pledge allegiance first to Jesus Christ and the Holy Bible. I am a Christian before I am an American, okay? I'm, I'm thankful for my heritage as an American. I'm thankful for many things about being an American. But the number one thing is the Lord. Because your freedom in this country will fall and go away. But your freedom in Christ is eternal. And that's what matters most. Now, I like liberty. In fact, I love liberty. In fact, I don't know, I, I more than love liberty, okay? I don't know what word to use, but Paul said where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I love the attitude that says, give me liberty or give me death. Not many people like that now. Whatever you think about our founding fathers, at least they had guts. At least they had the fear of God. They may not have been Bible-believing right dividers, but they feared God. <laughs> and I think there's proof to that. And that's a good thing. But anyway, um, liberty. I think we ought to stand for liberty, spiritually most importantly. But even the liberty we have, 
Why give it up so easily in America? I mean, we, this is a great gift that we have, a great opportunity. We shouldn't let it go without a fight. <laughs> a lot of people just hand it over. Just give me a roll of toilet paper. You can take the liberty. <laughs> now, by the way, the Bible said the simple believeth every word. The only thing you should trust fully is the Holy Bible. Okay. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of deception more than ever. And it's just going to get worse until the Lord comes. So we're called out of the world, but we still have responsibilities, responsibilities toward the state. So my view is Christians should be the best citizens in their community. And Romans 13 gives you reasons why. Let's read verses 1 to 4. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall, uh, resist shall receive themselves damnation. And it's obvious in the context. He's not talking about eternal damnation. He's talking about capital punishment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. So the first reason we ought to be good citizens is for wrath's sake. We ought to fear the wrath of government. I mean, that's what he said. Look at verse 5. Wherefore you, must be need, wherefore, you must needs be subject to the government, not only for wrath, that's a reason, but also for conscience' sake. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But first of all, for wrath's sake. Uh, the higher powers here refer to all governmental authorities, different levels. And by the way, it doesn't say which form of government, if you study history and you know anything about civics and all that, there's different forms of government. I happen to think ours is the best <laughs> as far as human government is concerned. Okay, when you understand what the Founding Fathers set up, which is not a democracy with the people ruling. That's crazy. That's not what it is. Our republic, that's this representative government, when you really analyze, and I was listening to a man from, and it was from 1969. He recorded a lecture on government and uh, he was speaking for the John Birch Society. And you talk about, man, the guy, he really, I, his name was G. Edward Griffin. And it's on YouTube, you ought to find it. I mean, really outlined the way things are supposed to function as far as what our founding fathers gave us. But whatever the form of government, there's different forms, but that's not the point. The point is human government is ordained of God. And therefore, we are to be subject to them because of their position of authority that God gave them, not because they're deserving, because they have such wonderful character and they're so easy to respect and follow. Look in Titus. Keep a mark in Romans 13. Think about who was in charge when Paul wrote this. <laughs> uh, um, you think about, for an example... The Roman Emperor Nero. He, I mean, the guy was a scumbag, okay? If you know anything about Nero. And that's putting it lightly. But Paul doesn't waste a bunch of time ripping on Nero. We got better things to preach. How about the gospel of Christ? <laughs> okay? So, Titus 3, put, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. So it's a good work for us to be in subjection to human government and be obedient. To speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers. So we're not, we're not supposed to be just constantly fighting the government and running them down. That's not going to solve anything. That's not our purpose. We have better things to do. But gentle, showing all meekness in all men. And one of the ways, you know, that's hard to do sometimes, but what will help us is to remember what we were before we got saved. <laughs> right? What do you expect, by the way, of lost people? Why do we act so shocked when lost men who are in government do bad things? 
Verse 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost and so on. The, the focus needs to be on the, on the gospel of Christ. That's the answer. But we're not supposed to be fighting the government and speaking evil against the government. Instead, we ought to be making intercession for them. Look in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 2. I'm just showing you what Paul told us about human government. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all... So here's a priority... Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings, for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. If we'll pray for our leaders and have a good attitude, we'll be leading a quiet and peaceable life. Not, not a brawling life where we're trying to bring insurrection and so forth. That, that's to be preferred. Paul said in Romans 12, As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, have all men to be saved. The number one thing we ought to be praying for our leaders is about is they get saved. Wouldn't that solve a lot of problems right there? <laughs> I always, when I pray for our leaders, I pray for our president, I pray for our governor, and I pray for our judges. I mean, there's so many levels, and you know, but when I pray for our government, I say, Lord, those who are lost, may they be saved. And then those that are, may they act like it. Stand up for what's right. Make intercession. So not only are we not to speak against the government, uh, but we are to make intercession for them. And we are to have an attitude of subjection, which is a willing thing. We willingly submit to their authority, recognizing God gave them that authority. Now, back in Romans 13, so we must acknowledge that they are the ministers of God, Paul called them. The ministers of God. I wish they would acknowledge that. Hey, ministers, you know what? Uh, government's supposed to serve the people. They're there to help the people. Not provide for them, by the way, but protect them. But Paul is not saying here that God put every individual official in office. And that, you know... Obama got elected because it was the will of God. And everybody who's ever... I don't believe that personally. I don't think that God... I think people have choices. I think, I think that people get elected because they get the most votes. You say, don't you believe God's at work? Yes, I do. But I don't think Paul's saying that God is putting every individual... What he, what he ordained is human government. That's the ordinance of God. That doesn't mean we've got to jump to the conclusion that everybody who ever gets in office... You know, the mayor of Jenkinsburg was put there by God Almighty before the foundation of the world. He gave a decree. I don't, I'm not a Calvinist. I don't really think that way. Now, God has a plan, and He's going to work His plan. But God gives men a choice. And, um, you know, in America, we supposedly get to elect our leaders, you know. But, so, I mean, that's the way it works. Now, human government, way back in Genesis 9 after the flood... It's still in effect. So there, are, there is overlapping to dispensational truth. Human government began with Noah after the flood in Genesis 9 where God gave man the authority to kill another man. He said if a man kills a man, then kill that man. That's capital punishment. That's authority. That's human government. Human government will be in effect until the second coming of Christ when, when now we have a theocracy when the Lord is on the throne in the world. But human government is in effect. Now, the, to disobey authority that God has ordained is to disobey God. Paul said if you resist the ordinance, uh, if you resist the power, you resist the ordinance of God. Kids need to think about that when they rebel against their parents. They're rebelling against God. I mean, God's the one that sets up authorities. And if God set up human government, and then we come along and we, have a, we just rebel against government and we totally disregard government, then we're saying we don't care what God said about it. 
Now, there is a great lack of respect for authority in our country. And the reason why is because there's a lack of the fear of God. If you fear God first, then you'll respect the way He set things up. Now, what is the basic function of human government? The way God set it up, it is to protect the good and punish the evil. That's it. That's, I mean, that's really at the essence of it. Peter said the same thing. We won't turn over there. We looked at it not long ago in our study in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2. Peter talked about the same concept. And by the way, you know what Peter said in that passage? Fear God, honor the king. In that order. Fear God first before you honor the king. Always put God first. So, the, the, the basic function is to protect the good and punish the evil. It is not to provide for people. It's not to give everybody a universal basic income. What are you talking about? I mean, that is not the role of government. Why can't we depend on God? It's so sad to see people are so quick to look to government for the answers. Right? The government is not supposed to be paying our bills. I got a lot I could say there, but I'm not going to. I'm running out of time. Protection. You know what? So there won't be anarchy, criminals just taking over. There is this issue of protection. So he talks about the sword. And Paul himself said, if I've done something worthy of death, then okay. Acts 25 verse 11. The capital punishment issue is still in effect today. But when the government punishes the good and even protects the evil, and I mean, when it gets that mixed up, we are not obligated to submit to their abuse of power. Look in 2 Corinthians 11. Second, I'm using Paul as an example of this now. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So if, if God said government is to protect the good, but then you have a government that starts punishing the good, we're not supposed to submit to that. Because they're out of order. So you see, when you put God first, you realize government has a God-given role. When they don't function in that role, then we're not obligated to follow that. We follow God first. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 20, uh, 32. In Damascus, the governor, I think his name was de Blasio, or Cuomo. <laughs> In Damascus, the governor under Eridus the king kept the city of the... By the way, de Blasio said, we will shut your church down, and if you still try to keep, we'll shut it down for good. That's what he said. I've got to follow Titus 3. And not speak evil, because I feel like speaking evil right now with that cat. So in Damascus, the governor under Eridus the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. Was that lawful? Was that right? Was Paul worthy of that? Paul's a good man. And they're trying to punish a good man. So what did Paul do? He turned himself in and said, I must always obey government. No, he said, through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. You get that? And look. We are not instructed to unconditionally obey the government. Was our founding fathers wrong for defying the king? I hear some grace preachers that are saying things make me think that if they would have been back in the revolution, they would have been a loyalist. No, I would have been right there <laughs> with a gun in my hand, my friend. Amen. And by the way, it was the preachers that did a lot in leading that revolution. But you know what? The king abuses power. And the Declaration of Independence proves it with, with, with all these reasons stated why they were... They had put up with his stuff for a long time before they said enough. And that was, that was not the church. That was the state. The church got involved. They can if they want. But the point is... In other words, we're not supposed to fight against a government that's operating properly. But if a government tries to interfere with the church, we don't have we can we should stand up against that. 
That's the right time to do it. There's a balance here. In other words, we're not looking to fight against the government just because we don't recognize government. We recognize government. But when the government ceases to be what God intended it to be, we do not have to follow that. That's why you have God blessing people for civil disobedience in the Bible. The Hebrew midwives, Pharaoh, the king, said kill, and we're going to see it in the next message, so we won't turn over there right now, kill all the Hebrew uh, male children. No, we won't. They disobeyed, and God blessed them for their disobedience. What about you must bow down to this image? Daniel 3, the three Hebrews said, no, we'd rather die. We're not doing it. You can't pray. Here's a new law. You can't pray. Daniel opened his windows and prayed anyway. Daniel chapter 6 went to the den of lions for it. They put God first. In Acts chapter 4, quit preaching in the name of Christ. Stop it. <laughs> they put him in prison. You know, but God busted him out and said, go stand and speak in the temple all the words of this life. You do what I tell you to do. Acts 4 and 5 in there, you can take the time to read that. You know the story, but they were telling them, look, you, you're, you're going to stop preaching in the name of Christ. Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then it says, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Daily in the temple. <laughs> and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach. They were told not to do it, and they did it anyway. Why? Because you obey God first. So our founding fathers, back to that for just a second, the reason why they rebelled, there was 13 colonies that rebelled because they understood Romans 13. That just happens to work out that way, you know. They understood the king was abusing his power. They did go along with it for plenty of... I mean, it's not like they just... People think that just as soon as the king did one thing they didn't like, then they did an insurrection. That's not how it worked. In America, we've been given great liberty. And that liberty has been secured by a great price. And when authorities abuse their power and go against their own laws, we have the freedom to resist that and to protest that and say we're not going along with that. We have liberties as Americans to do that. Paul knew his, liber Paul knew his rights as a Roman citizen, right? When they bound him, they're about to whip him. He looked at him and said, is it lawful to whip a Roman uncondemned? They go, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> And then they kept doing all this junk with his trial, and he finally said, I appeal to Caesar. He had that right. He, he knew what his rights were, and he used those rights. But sadly, there are churches today, and look, I think a lot of them ought to stay shut down because they're preaching false gospels and teaching false doctrine. But there are Bible-believing churches out there, and I've heard what the pastors have had to say, and the way some of them are coming across, they're not going to reopen till the governor says they can and for some of them, that's going to be next month or longer. And some of them are trying to use spirituality for a cloak of their cowardice. Folks, there have been people down through history that suffered greatly to do the work of the Lord. And to meet together with other believers. And there's still people like that in this world that have to go underground, have to do... And we're going to just turn over our... Say, so, okay, state, now you can tell us when to meet and how to meet. That's not lawful. That's not lawful. It's not biblical and it's not lawful. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. The church is God's. God tells us how to do things. And, and don't give me this stuff. Well, you know, Paul, I know what we're teaching what Paul said. And he said, when they're a minister to thee for good, then, then you sub, submit to that, what God gave that authority. God gave that uh, ordinance. But when they start punishing good people for doing good things, when they let criminals out of jail because they don't want to get a virus, and then they put pastors in it, I'm not going along with that. 
We ought not just relinquish. And look, there. This has been. This has been a whatever. Again, my my point this morning is not whatever. Everybody has a different opinion about the virus itself. I'm talking about all the stuff that that surrounds it. Because I said way back on March 15th that before, I mean, early on in this thing, I said the problem's going to be what people do. It's going to be the response. It's going to be what they use this for. And when it's all said and done, there'll be far more damage done because of how this was handled or mishandled. And so I'm going to have to just give you the points because I'm not going to be able to keep on teaching this. But in Romans 13, for wrath's sake, but then he said conscience sake. And he basically talks about because they're ministering continually and, you know, government, if it's going to function, there's going to be taxes. There's a place for that. There's a place for that. It gets abused. <laughs> but there's a place for taxes, and Paul teaches to render the, the dues. If they're, in other words, if you're going to drive on a county road, then pay the county tax, you know, that type of thing. Uh, I recognize sometimes, well, not just sometimes, it, there's a great abuse on, on taxes in this country. But that's not my study right now. <laughs> um, but for conscience sake, if God set it up, and they're doing this, they have a God-given role, then for conscience sake, you ought to support that. And then verses 8 to 10, it's for love's sake. Um, love is the fulfilling of the law. If you love your neighbor, you won't kill him. You won't commit adultery with his wife. You won't steal from him. He talks about these commandments and says if you have love, then you will, it'll fulfill the, the, the moral commandments of the law. And then for Christ's sake, in verses 11 to 14, we looked at those verses, I think, was it last week we preached in there? And uh, about um, how we ought to wake out of sleep and put on the armor um, and, and live honestly. And, uh, and so you, in this chapter, you go from fear to conscience to loving others to devotion to Christ. If you fear the government that's operating the way it's supposed to, and by the way, if government actually punished criminals like they were supposed to, it would do a world of good. <laughs> there, I saw the other day where this joker got arrested three times within 12 hours for the same crime because they kept letting them out because they, they didn't want them to get the virus in jail. Three times in 12 hours. But fear to conscience to love to, to serving Christ, if you will... Follow Romans 13, you'll be the best citizen in your community. <laughs> but there's a balance. Okay, I'm not, I'm not up here advocating we just rebel against government just to do it. But when they start telling us when we can have church and how we can have church, the governor of the state of Georgia has zero authority over Hope Bible Church. Right, I'm talking about the Constitution, folks. I'm talking about the Bill of Rights. I mean, that's what our founding fathers bled and died for. Now, if he says this is a health emergency, please help us out, and that's what he said. We went along with that. But there comes a point where the church has to make its own decision, and we have that freedom, and let's use it before we lose it. 